So here we go, the second part of chapter 26. We're going to begin talking primarily about inflation, which of course is a rise in the general level of prices. Uh, inflation is problematic because it makes you feel poorer. The purchasing power of your dollars goes down because the dollar itself becomes less valuable. So how do we figure out how much inflation we have? We already know how to construct a price index. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is the most common index used in figuring out inflation. So there's, like all index, there is a market basket, okay, indices I should say, there's a market basket. This is, you know, the base year was uh, an average of 82 to 84. You take the current year, divide it by the base year, multiply times 100, and that gives you a number, okay? So let's say that the number for this year is 207.3, and the number for last year was 201.6. You do 207.3 minus 201.6 to get the difference in the index from uh, last year to this year, and then you divide by last year. And that tells you, once you multiply by 100, what your inflation rate is. Know that the Fed sets a target of 2%. That is what is considered healthy inflation. So here are some inflation rates in a couple different cities. You can see Japan, Japan is actually going through a deflationary period, um, and that's going to be pretty problematic. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and then you can see that the U.S. Uh, moves around a lot, but is generally in the neighborhood of 2 to 3, um, at least was during the 2000s. And you can see a longer-term chart here. So in the 2000s, we were in this 2 to 3 range, but certainly uh, you know, in the 70s, we had pretty high inflation at various points. So additionally, um, there are different types of inflation, and this uh, is, is important. So our two are demand pull inflation and cost push inflation. Demand pull is caused by ex basically excessive spending. Consumers have the equivalent of too much money. Consumers are spending so much money that producers aren't able to meet that demand so they wind up raising price. This can happen because the central bank issues too much money. This is usually one of the causes of uh, the recent Great Recession, the fact that we had what's called uh, easy monetary policy. Um, but demand pull inflation isn't that difficult to stop because there are plenty of things that the government can do in order to make sure that people are not able to continue spending excessively. And through the use of monetary and fiscal policy, of course, the government, the easiest thing that it can do is spend less money. All they have to do is make their decision, we're going to spend less, and then all of that government spending that they choose not to spend then comes out of aggregate spending, and that can be helpful. So you can imagine how easy it is to stop excess spending. Uh, and there are other plenty of other levers that we'll talk about. The more complicated one is cost-push inflation. So quickly, um, we can just draw our graph uh, our micrograph from last semester. So you have supply here and demand here, and you can imagine that a negative supply shock happens. Well, what that means, of course, is that the price, oops, the price rises. Now, in micro, we would say, you know, we're just in a, a market for a particular thing. But imagine if this particular supply isn't referring to one particular thing, it's referring to all things. So then we label it aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And then this graph becomes the graph for the whole economy. And over here, we don't have price. We have price level. So this is the general level of prices. Okay, And then down here, of course, uh, we have the quantity. Okay, So that would be something that would cause this idea of, of inflation coming from a supply shock. When things, when inputs become unexpectedly significantly more expensive, then we have what's called cost push inflation. This one is difficult to deal with because you're either going to wind up with a recession and then the economy will adjust the way Adam Smith said it would eventually, or the whatever caused the supply shock is going to have to work itself out. All right, so um, unfortunately, it's hard to figure out which is which. So we need to do that. Um, but demand pull will be stopped when excess spending goes away. Cost push typically ends in a recession. 
Now there's this other kind of inflation that we talk about, which is core inflation, which core inflation is basically all the stuff that we care about other than food and energy. Now, of course, on the one hand, if you look at how your family spends money, food and energy are very significant portions of your budget. So that can be a little bit problematic. A lot of people would say that, okay, fine, core inflation is at 1%, but if total inflation when you include food and energy is 5%, well, since so much of my income goes to food and energy, inflation rate might feel closer to 5 than the core inflation rate of only 1. Um, because the prices are just so much more stable once you pull out food and energy, which tend to be some of the more volatile ones. All right, now uh, keep in mind we still have our nominal income and our real income. Our nominal income is what is maybe written on our paychecks. Uh, it's unadjusted for inflation. And what matters is if we want to know about our real income, how much we're really making, then we say, how much did our nominal income change? What's the percent change in our nominal income? Then we have to subtract the percent change in price level. So if I get a raise of 5%, I can be thinking to myself, oh, sweet, I just got a 5% raise. But if in the same period, the inflation rate was 2%, then what that actually means is my real income rose by 3%. So did I get a 5% raise? Yes, in nominal dollars. But do I care about nominal dollars? The answer is typically not really. I care about real income. So my 5% raise is actually a 3% increase in purchasing power or real income. Now, inflation will always cause winners and losers. So who gets hurt? Who are the losers in a high uh, inflationary period? So if you're on a fixed income, if your income is, you know, you're just going to get, say, $1,000 a week for the rest of your life, right? Today, that'd be a pretty good income, right? $52,000, that's above the median. Lots of families are living on way less. But over time, your real income will fall every time there's a period of inflation, okay? So that, you know, $1,000, if you were getting $1,000 a week, say, 20 years ago, you were, you were pushing on upper middle class. $1,000 a week 20, uh, 20 years from now, that might be where the poverty level is, depending on what inflation does. So additionally, um, saving, typically you know, right now, saving rates, the interest rate that you, re that you earn on money that you save, is relatively low. So for example, if you just look at your savings account right now, you might be getting paid 0.0125% as low as, so that's like, that's not, I mean, that's a tenth of a percent. And if inflation is at roughly plus two, then the money in your savings account is actually getting less valuable. Now, of course, if you put it under your mattress, it's getting even more less valuable. And over time, as inflation rises, typically this number will rise, but we gotta see. Now, um, if you're a creditor, if you loan people money, and they're paying you back, say, at a fixed rate of 7% interest, and then inflation, which you expected to be 2%, actually goes up to 5%, then your real rate of interest, real IR, actually equals 2%. You thought that inflation was gonna be two, so you thought your real interest rate was gonna be five, but instead, it gets knocked all the way back because of this unanticipated inflation that you didn't build into the price. If you thought, you know, if your plan was, I got to make 5% on this loan and there's going to be 5% interest, what interest rate do I have to charge? What's my nominal interest rate? Pause and think about it. 10%. So, who is unaffected by inflation? If you have a job that gives you what are called COLAs, or cost of living adjustments, then you know, your, your rising income is connected to the inflation rate, so your income is going to rise as fast as inflation, you'll be okay. If you are on Social Security, Social Security is indexed to inflation, so you'll be okay. Union members, that's usually one of the big things that they bargain for, is good cost of living adjustments. If you borrow money, if you are a debtor, not a creditor, 
and you are paying back a loan with cheaper dollars, then you won. Okay, so there are winners and losers. Um, but it's important that we think about the, the real interest rate that's adjusted for inflation, the anticipated interest rate. Um, so this is why a long-term loan will always have a higher interest rate than a short-term loan because banks or whoever the creditor is, they are confident that they can forecast economic conditions 12 months down the road, but they're going to be less confident that they can correctly forecast uh, economic conditions five years down the road or 10 years down the road. So the longer the, the term, uh, typically the lower, I'm sorry, the, the higher the interest rate that you're going to have to pay. Then your nominal interest rate we already talked about is the rate that's not adjusted for inflation. So here's uh, something else or something very similar to what you saw in graphic form. If your nominal interest rate is 11 and your inflation premium, this is what you are paying to cover the inflation, then the creditors are actually earning a 5% real return on their uh, investment in you. So deflation, um, deflation we have decided is actually worse uh, than inflation. We, so we would prefer low inflation to deflation. So while it might feel like your income will rise, fixed asset values will typically fall. Um, and businesses get really leery here because if business values go down, then they're typically going to invest less. If they invest less, they start cutting jobs. When they start cutting jobs, incomes fall. So if, if your income becomes more valuable, that's good. But if you lose it because you lose your job, then that's worse. And we'll talk more about that spiral uh, in the future. And of course, the whole thing can be a little bit arbitrary at times. So um, cost push inflation is going to have a significant impact on output. There's, there's little doubt about that. That shift, that leftward shift in supply you can imagine that um, you know your output is going to go down. Okay, um, demand pull inflation is um, is a little bit easier to to deal with um, because we have better levers that we'll go into when we talk about monetary and fiscal policy for dealing with this. Um, but the question always is how much inflation is right. Some people say zero. But of course, zero means that you are vacillating between low levels of inflation and low levels of deflation. But you're going to see later on that the, lately the Fed has gone for mild inflation with, the, with never going below zero. That has been the goal for the last couple of decades. Hyperinflation, you know, we, we talk about Zimbabwe and their $100 trillion, about $100 trillion bill. Uh, they, they didn't buy you anything because it was so worthless, even at $100 trillion. They had a 14.9 billion percent inflation rate, uh, which is just absolutely, it's, it's mind-boggling. Um, but why is hyperinflation so bad? Well, it's just devastating to an economy. Nobody knows what to charge because they don't know what it's going to cost them tomorrow. So I don't want to charge you, you know, $1,000 for a loaf of bread if there's a chance that $1,000 will not buy me the loaf of bread from my supplier tomorrow in order to replace it on the shelf. So I'm just going to stop selling anything for fear that I can't buy anything for those same prices. And obviously then money eventually just becomes worthless because, you know, if you're going to, if you have to entice somebody to sell you bread by offering them more and more and more and more money, well, eventually people are just going to have no confidence that money is ever going to be worth anything again. So the stock market, you know, the, the biggest thing to understand here are bubbles. Now, the stock market is not inflation. It's not a very good economic indicator. We've talked about how these bubbles can be very detrimental to the economy. You know, there's clearly a real estate bubble in the Great Recession. We've talked all about that. Um, you know, I don't think that this is a great time to be throwing the stock market in. We'll talk more about it, but now is not. Uh, the best time. You want to learn a little bit more about the macro economy before we start talking about stock prices. And that's it for this unit. So we're finished with chapter 26 and, uh, and we're now just going to kind of clean things up. We have our test coming up very soon, so check the calendar and you will see everything there. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's uh, always a pleasure and I hope that you ask any questions you might have during class. Take care.